how many salespeople do you talk to that say they have an ineffective manager and they don't trust, you know, they don't necessarily trust 80%, them. 80%. Yeah. 80%. Exactly. So, you know, okay, great. You're trying to coach me on my call. I don't believe anything that you say. Well, okay, let me help calibrate you against the top performer. Ah, now I believe what you say and I'm going to take that feedback seriously. So it gives the manager, um, it enables the manager and gives them more credibility because all other salespeople want to learn from is the people that are hitting their number, blowing out their number. What are they doing and how do I replicate that? So, you know, enablement is to get you up into that point. And hopefully that enablement is weaving in best practices from top performers as you're iterating. In this episode, we embark on a journey with Haley Katzman, an accomplished go-to-market leader renowned for her experience in building and scaling high-performing teams. Currently, she serves as the Vice President of Global Strategic Accounts at Highspot. She leads a top-tier team dedicated to driving strategy, revenue, and unparalleled customer experience for the largest Global 2000 accounts. And throughout the discussion, Haley shares her wealth of expertise and the experiences she's had in sales leadership, offering invaluable insights into the evolving landscape of sales strategies and team dynamics. From prioritizing productivity over relentless growth to fostering alignment across revenue teams, Haley unveils practical strategies for success in today's competitive market. We explore the intersection of AI and revenue enablement and delve into the importance of coaching to maximize team performance and gain exclusive career advice from a seasoned leader like Haley. Toward the end of the interview and in honor of Women's History Month, Haley shares her personal journey and reveals the challenges and triumphs of being a woman in sales leadership, offering inspiration and empowerment to aspiring leaders worldwide. All right, Haley, thank you for being here. When we were talking offline, you had mentioned to me that uh, in your board level discussions and your advisory work, that the common theme is in the, the top of mind discussion is prioritizing productivity over relentless growth and getting to a point where we can implement and execute on the ideas that we learned in 2023 around efficient growth and, and these sorts of things. Um, so can you double click on on that aspect for me when you talk about prioritizing productivity over relentless growth? Where do you go with that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a few years ago, like you mentioned, it was really all about growth at all costs. And now the shift, you know, from a company organization standpoint has really been to profitability um, from a from a business lens. And then what that translates to for the sales and marketing organization is productivity. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, one of our board slides or, you know, one of the most common board slides that you'd always see, you know, for a very long time was always around attainment um, from a sales standpoint. So it's not like a completely new concept, but it was never the case that the attainment conversation or that slide in the board deck translated to a productivity conversation and how you were trying to drive increased productivity. And so I think um, before it was more kind of health of the business, um, even kind of employee, um, you know, engagement, satisfaction. Do you have, you know, are, are people, you know, generally hitting quota? Are they happy to work there? Are you going to have a retention problem, especially during the pandemic when hiring was insane? It was all about, you know, people need to be hitting quota if you want to retain them. Now it's about productivity and we want that distribution curve. Um, from a quota attainment standpoint, to be a healthy balance where you see about 70% of reps hitting about 70% or higher attainment. Mm -hmm. And what most organizations will see is that you have, you know, 20% of your reps carrying 80% of the revenue, which introduces an insane amount of, you know, risk um, from a forecasting standpoint, from a performance standpoint, um, from an employee morale standpoint. Um, you know, it's just in all ways is, is, is not good. Um, so I do think that that, you know, we'll talk about it oftentimes as participation rate. What's your participation rate? 70% of reps hitting 70% of quota or 70% of reps hitting 60% of quota. You want that nice distribution curve. Um, and I think that that's, there's a new kind of way of looking at the attainment, um, data, um, now with the focus on productivity. Why don't you want everybody at hundred percent? <laughs> well, um, that would be great, but it's, it's probably not, not reality. I mean, I think, I mean, honestly, if everyone were at 100% attainment, your quotas are probably too low, right? Um, that's, that's probably um, what the answer is. So that's why you want that balance. I mean, what we'll oftentimes look at is we want to see 70% at 70% attainment, and we want to see 50% at 100% attainment. And if you kind of cross-reference those two numbers, then you have a nice, healthy balance across the organization. Um, but you constantly want to be looking at that relative to your capacity, because if everyone's hitting quota, then presumably you can 
either increase quotas or decrease patch sizes, um, but you, you have a capacity constraint that you can kind of play with a little bit more. And that's at the end of the day, what productivity comes back to. I mean, why is efficiency part of productivity? Well, if you can do more with less, then you can cover more accounts or bring in more revenue or whatever that, that metric is. Um, I oftentimes see people talking about efficiency, but then no action of what they're going to do with that additional time and productivity doesn't come to fruition unless you actually action the efficiency gains. Ooh, yeah, that's going to be clipped right there. It, it, <laughs> so often as frontline managers, we will try and block and tackle and remove barriers and streamline processes, give you time back. Um, yeah. But where is that time going? Are we just going? To... Yeah, <laughs> well, that's why I always think of productivity as efficiency and effectiveness. Love that. And efficiency is going to get you the time back. Effectiveness is like how well you're doing something. And mm -hmm. you know, if you look at those two metrics, if I could give you, you know, four hours of selling time back per week, or I could increase, you know, your win rates by one or two points, which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick the win rates every day of the week every because day. it has a direct impact on revenue. And so really, I think when you're having a productivity conversation, the biggest lever that you can pull is not necessarily the efficiency gains, but it's actually the effectiveness gains. I think historically, it's just been really hard for companies to do that in a systematic, strategic way. And that's where I think, you know, this productivity conversation is really one that we should have been having for many years. Um, but just what's happening from a, you know, economic standpoint is really putting more pressure on that now that companies are focused on profitability over growth at all costs. Well, in the vein of productivity, where do you see, and you mentioned systems, so I think this question is warranted. <laughs> where do you see or how can companies go about better aligning enablement and rev ops? Because if we think about systems <laughs> and productivity and efficiency gains and effectiveness gains, these are Obviously, I think about management and the individual, <laughs> but yeah, but these, yeah. these two teams or, or one team in some respects are really important. So they're oftentimes our... not treated as one. And oftentimes mm -hmm. that's due to like organizational kind of uh, constraints or maybe even technology constraints sometimes, right. or even timing and cadence constraints. But if you really want to have an effective revenue engine, operations and enablement have to be operating as one cohesive unit that then partners effectively with sales and marketing and the other customer facing teams. You know, if you think about um, what operations is driving, you know, they're doing revenue planning, revenue modeling, designing territories, comp plans, developing process, implementing systems. On the enablement side, they're doing everything from, you know, foundational programs like onboarding or product enablement to what they should be doing as more strategic enablement that says, you know, if you step back for a second, back to the kind of those boardroom level conversations, the conversation looks like this. We want to grow X percent year over year. Let's just say it's we want to grow 15, 20 percent year over year. Well, how are you going to do that? You either have to hire more reps or you have to increase their quota or increase your productivity <laughs> metrics. Right. And if you want to then drive strategic enablement, your enablement team has to understand what strategic initiatives are going to enable the teams to increase by 15 or 20 percent right like you can't just magically you know get people to you know go and sell more you have to be doing something to make that happen now it could be something that's more of a go-to-market initiative like acquiring a company and launching you know a, a new product it could be cross-selling could be going into a new market um, or it could be something that's going to drive more efficiency and effectiveness gains, like implementing a new sales methodology or updating your sales process, those types of things. Mm -hmm. But just writing down the process or right. even implementing it in your CRM isn't going to equip or train reps to actually go and drive that behavior change. So if you step back, I really think of ops as helping define the process that's going to help you get to that incremental growth. And then enablement has to develop the strategy to drive that behavioral change. And if those two things aren't in lockstep, then you're driving behavior change over here and you have a company strategy over here and they're not working hand in hand. And that's where you see initiatives oftentimes fail or missed you know, revenue targets. Um, so I really think it's important for them to come together. And you can kind of almost hear that like, Ops is kind of the effective or the efficiency part of productivity. Right. Enablement is kind of the effectiveness of productivity, and those coming together are really where I think you get great productivity gains. Right. It's it, it's almost as if enablement should be called operations in some respect, because what I just heard is there's a conceptual layer where we write it down, we speak it, we map it to our CRM, but 
until you actually operationalize the elements that are going to move the needle, like you talked about those different uh, initiatives, mm -hmm. it's it's enablement that's put, putting that into practice, right? It's a joint effort, probably. They're with driving management. operational rigor is how I talk about it there a you lot. Go. Like, okay. It's right, like operations is developing what the like process is, but then to have the rigor around that operational process is really where where enablement should come in. Love that. And continuing on the productivity thread, uh, another element you had mentioned, I think ties to this is the the talent aspect of how you increase productivity, do more with less and grow in a healthy manner. So double click on your your what you're seeing around the thing where companies are cutting off their talent pool potentially, yeah. where they're focusing exclusively on senior talent and very experienced talent. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of companies right now are trying to bet on things where they have a high level of confidence, whether that's product related, whether it's people related, strategy related. And, you know, a sure bet is a very tenured, experienced salesperson that has, you know, multiple years of hitting, you know, one, two, three hundred percent of their quota. Um, granted they're more expensive, but if you can show the returns on that, then it's, you know, there's a high level of confidence that if you are able to, you know, attract and hire and retain those individuals that you can get closer to that 70 on 70 kind of distribution curve from a quota perspective. I think what companies aren't thinking about as much right now is what that's going to mean for a longer term standpoint. And I'm not talking like 20 years, I'm talking like hmm. five three, five, seven years is that, you know, once upon a time, those very tenured experienced sellers were SDRs or SMBAEs um, or very early in career. And I think that the combination of everyone being, you know, more remote than they were before, plus, you know, scaling back SDR teams, plus shifting business up market, you know, we're really cutting off the talent pool for our future sellers and the next generation of very tenured, experienced um, individuals. And so I think that companies are going to have to be a lot more intentional on how they transfer tribal knowledge, how they equip those early in career individuals, um, whether it's through, you know, things like better enablement, whether it's through mentor programs, whether it's um, by having, you know, internship programs, those types of things. Um, but I think companies are going to have to be careful. Otherwise in, you know, five years, they're not going to have a talent pool to pull from. <laughs> yeah. I know I work with a lot of SDR teams. Those that kind of know my background and my, my area of focus. And I always like to promote the idea of sales development representatives being your future account executives, your Absolutely. future leaders and, and these sorts of things. Yep. But more and more, I'm starting to hear the, the retraction message of sales development and companies that are determine, you know, maybe we don't need an SDR team. Maybe we can do more with less and just have outbound and, and this sort of top of funnel managed by our account, account executives. So do you see in, from in your experience and the uh, companies you work with where SDRs are successfully moving on, where they do have it and they haven't made that cutback? Yeah. Do you see them making the promote the, the track up? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of companies are scaling back those teams because there's so much more of a focus on the bottom line when companies are having a hard time increasing their top line, right? You only basically have two constraints there. And if you can't improve the top, you got to cut the bottom. So they're like, okay, well, our AE should now just be able to prospect and we don't need as big of an SDR <laughs> our team. Um, it's unfortunate because I do think that um, those individuals um, can be some of your top performing reps. And I think for us, what we look at is we want to have a healthy mix of the two, right? We want to bring in, you know, some external senior talent that has experience selling to companies like, you know, in the global 2000, but we also want to nurture and develop talent from within. If I look at most of our top performing individuals today across most of our customer facing teams, I would say at least 50% were ones that came up through the SDR team that are absolutely crushing their number. They're selling up in the higher segments, whether they're an AE or an AM or in customer success, um, maybe even enablement or sales engineering. I think that's been one of the, you know, most um, exciting and gratifying parts of, you know, my career here at Highspot is seeing those individuals that, you know, hired six, seven years ago, um, right out of college and the, 
you know, massive amount of success that they've had here at the company. And what better way to build a really great talent pool than to have those individuals, you know, learning from experienced talent that we're hiring externally um, and vice versa. You just get a really nice balance. Um, but I think if you cut off all of one or the other, then you're going to get an imbalance. It's, it's all about the mix there. <laughs> right, right. Well, I appreciate that quite a bit. I always see how there's a gap sometimes in organizations where going from SDR to an account executive is is enormous. You know, the yeah. criteria that we expect for an account executive, 10, 15 years experience, right? And then the SDRs never have the closing experience. So how do they logically... Got, yeah, it's like, how do people think that the first time that the person who's, you know, sold to, you know, a Fortune 5 company started out, they were SDRs. Right. So, you know, I, I think it's critically important. And it doesn't mean that it, it has to be all of your SDRs convert into AEs. It might be one or two per year, but you have to have a path for growth. Um, if not, you're just going to give that person up to probably another organization who's going to develop them and, you know, um, have to hire them back later on at a much <laughs> higher rate. Yeah. And there's, and there's something to say about, you know, hiring people who have, uh, a, a lot of experience too. You know, sometimes Absolutely. you have to unlearn things in some respects. Yeah. 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 No, that's why I think the balance is really important. And I think that extreme of anything is is never good. Um, so if you can get the balance right, um, then I think we'll, we'll be set up for success. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's switch gears. I want to bring AI into the conversation, artificial right. intelligence. Uh, we talked a little bit offline about the topic and it's, obviously top of mind with most people and probably to the point where it's been, you know, talked to death, <laughs> sure. but there's always so many different angles about this. And so I, I want to talk about AI in the context of sales enablement. There was a, uh, there was a blog post that I spot put out not too sure. long ago. Um, and it was all about how AI is being leveraged in sales processes and whatnot. So I want to read uh, a passage to you, a couple passages, and then get your, your thoughts on this. Okay. Um, so in part of this uh, blog post, it reads AI turbocharges marketing and sales leaders ability to identify the behaviors of successful sellers and replicate those behaviors across the entire team, taking the guesswork out of what good looks like. So that's point number one. Mm -hmm. And later on it reads, that there's three areas right now where AI is demonstrating potential uh, for sales processes and sales enablement specifically. Yeah. So number one is automation. Number two is co-creation. And number three is instant insights. So I want to talk about instant insights with you yeah. around the sales enablement. Now, on, under the section, it reads, if a manager wants to ensure their team is cross-selling a new product to each customer in, in each customer meeting, they can simply query the tool and see where they missed the opportunity. So that's mm -hmm. the um, kind of shortening the, the, the section mm -hmm. there. But my point is this, it's great that AI can identify things that happened in the past mm -hmm. and to help mitigate things happening in the future. But mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the realm of instant insights, what are your thoughts on AI helping salespeople in real time in, in sense of the real time interactions? I'm on a discovery call, I'm on a demo and I have AI prompting me and the reason I'm asking this is because wouldn't it be great to get to a point where we're mitigating those missed opportunities altogether as opposed to just learning from them? Yep. I mean, I think, um, yes. I mean, I have um, a lot of a lot of thoughts on this. I mean, I think there's so much power in how AI can better, you know, equip and train reps. And I think the instant insights really at the end of the day becomes a tool to coach at scale. Mm -hmm. um, but to your question around, you know, getting those insights like, on the call as you and I are talking. I have maybe a little bit of a controversial view on it because I think that done well, you know, if, if I just step back and think about like an enablement strategy done really well, you know, selling is all about having a high level of confidence in what you're doing, right? And I think enablement at the end of the day needs to equip and train, but what's the purpose of training? The purpose of training is to make the individual confident that they can go and have that conversation effectively before okay. they get into the call. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you're having to rely on like, you know, things being flashed at you on the meeting, not only do I think were you potentially not as prepared going into the meeting, but I also think that it's incredibly distracting. Like, you know, I think that we have a hard enough time getting salespeople to just listen enough on the call. 
and we can get some insights um, of that through AI by seeing what the you know dialogue, the back and forth, you know, looks like. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, you need to be comp you as a, as a salesperson need to be confident going into that conversation about the product that you're trying to cross sell in that scenario. Now getting coaching and feedback and AI recommendations on how to follow up or what you could have done better to improve that should gradually get you better over time. Sure. Um, I think when you get into maybe some, you know, support or customer success scenarios, there might be a better and different use case for that of getting, you know, real time answers that is more of a kind of knowledge based type scenario. But I think as it relates to the scenario that you mentioned with a seller that's looking to cross sell, I mean, you got to, you know, that's, that's, that's a play you got to be able to run. Like you got to know how to cross sell the product that you're trying to sell and you need to be confident going into it. So I think that work needs to be done in advance and then the coaching needs to happen after. Fair enough. So one thing is not creating a crutch to, to the confidence yeah. piece, yeah. right? Because if I know I'm going to have this widget, yeah, <laughs> yeah, why do I need to go through this content? Yeah. Why do we need to study and train? I, I have my training wheels For on the call. More technical with type teams, like think sales engineering or support or, you know, services, those like, it might make sense because in that scenario, there might be 10,000 questions that you have to answer. And sure, you can't memorize all of those. So getting those quick instant answers can be really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. But if you have a strategic initiative, like I need to cross sell a product or I need to deliver value or whatever it is, like you got to just know how to do that. Like, otherwise, why are you in sales? <laughs> and so I think that it's the company's job to effectively enable you to be able to do that. And where AI can come in is it, you know, creates automation so that you can streamline things. It gives you those instant insights so that you can quickly get to what are the best practices of top performers and how does that compare to how I'm either practicing or how I am on, you know, real world calls um, so that you can, you know, be consistently improving. Now on the coaching piece though, let's say I do mm -hmm. use AI to identify those coaching opportunities uh, around a particular call, for instance, right? Uh, AI was running on my last demo, yeah. it was 45 minutes, and now it's produced some uh, actionable insights for my manager yeah. for me. Do you think that there's a, a, a world that exists where AI is taking into account the greater context, meaning looking back at previous coaching plans, um, looking at the, the, the greater call. context, yep. right? Of not just what happened on that call. I mean, that's but... what we have today. Like that, okay. that, that exists and it, it, that's what it should be doing, right? You should be looking at where, you know, I, I think of enablement as really like, if you simplify, um, you know, kind of what you're trying to do from a behavioral standpoint, you're trying to uncover best practices to amplify across the entire team, or you're trying to uncover those worst practices or where someone maybe isn't doing something so that you can either have a skills coaching conversation or a performance management conversation. So first and foremost, the coaching relative to AI should help you uncover what those coaching opportunities are. You don't want to sit there and listen to every freaking call, right? right. So it's first is like, help me figure out what I should coach on, because I can tell you that the rep telling you what they need to be coached on is not what they need to be coached on. Right. And so step one is getting the right things to coach on. And then step two is comparing it to those best practices versus worst practices so that you can calibrate because, you know, let's just even think when we develop quotas or what performance people can do, you're always calibrating off of the upper echelon of performance, right? You don't know what the answer is. You're saying, well, these 20% of people did, you know, 1.5 million. So I think we can get it to 1.6 the next year. Like you're constantly calibrating, doing a comparison across what the top performers are. That's what the coaching should do as well. This person did this. It was successful at moving this deal through the sales cycle and generated this amount of revenue. Do more of that. Your call was this similar or dissimilar to that call. Um, but I do think that it's like step one, identify what you should coach on. And then step two is calibrate it relative to, you know, top performers. Yeah, that's a really good point there. The mm -hmm. calibrating and the knowledge transfer to top performers of facilitating that because that's what we modeled everything in. I mean, think about yeah. win loss analysis and it's trying to do <laughs> yeah, lookalikes, right? Yep. It's even but, interesting from a reporting standpoint, like if you look at most reporting that's out there, none of it is a, a few, like there's some technology out there, but not a lot of it is comparison based. It's oftentimes just like, here's what the performance is. And really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many opens or the pipeline or whatever, it's all should be calibrating against what your top person is doing, because that's what the potential or capacity is for the team. 
And then when you, you get into performance management conversations, when yes. the HRs at the table, that's what they're going to be looking at. When legals yeah. at this conversation, you're thinking about exiting someone from the business, it's going to be like, where's the overall average productivity has this person yeah. compared to their peers? And, and they're ranked this, number, you know, 15 out of the 15 people on your team, then, you know, they should just know that they're already at the bottom of performance. It shouldn't even be a, let me tell you about this conversation. Yeah, let's, I've been noticing something. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you mentioned something that I thought was profound in our offline conversation. You mentioned that uh, coaching is, uh, let me find it here. Coaching is where you close the loop on everything else that you do from an enablement standpoint. What did you mm -hmm. mean when you said that? Yeah, I mean, I think that everything that you're doing from an enablement standpoint is to prepare someone for that moment of action. Um, but what's really important to know is that most enablement that's done, most, is um, somewhere in between a one-to-many and a one-to-one, -one, right? Like marketing is going to be one-to-many, like website thing, right? Coaching is one-to-one -one. and enablement sits somewhere in the middle, right? Because you're designing it ideally for a particular audience. Maybe it's a role, maybe it's a region, maybe it's a business unit, whatever it is, but it's still not going to be like deal oriented. It's going to be, you know, kind of people or team oriented, when you get into coaching, coaching is relative to the actual scenario, right? And that's where the one-to-one -one conversations come in. And so I think that transfer of knowledge of preparing someone for a general but somewhat specific scenario like cross-selling product B, right? Then you actually go and have the conversation and you need that feedback loop to say in this particular scenario where maybe you were talking to this persona or is this industry or whatever the specifics of the deal are, maybe it was a competitive scenario. You need that coaching to tie that back to everything that you learned up into that point. It's the kind of fast twitch iterations that help bring it to life and ultimately um, at the end of the day, build that confidence so that the person can go in and apply that in many different scenarios. Um, so I think enablement kind of gets you up to that point, you know, equip, make sure you have the content, you know, what plays you're supposed to run, you have the guidance, you're trained effectively, but then that coaching is where you go, okay, you did it. <laughs> now let's iterate. Now let's have that. Let's feedback. calibrate. Let's go back to the yeah. calibrating you were talking about. Let's exactly. calibrate to what good looks like. Here's what you did. Yes. And we're getting closer. We're getting, you're yeah. almost there. Tonality well, or the calibration, accuracy. Helps the calibration helps because how many, how many salespeople do you talk to that say they have an ineffective manager and they don't trust, you know, they don't necessarily trust 80%, them. 80%. Yeah. 80%. Exactly. So, you know, okay, great. You're trying to coach me on my call. I don't believe anything that you say. Well, okay. Let me help calibrate you against the top performer. Ah, now I believe what you say and I'm going to take that feedback seriously. So it gives the manager, um, it enables the manager and gives them more credibility because all other salespeople want to learn from is the people that are hitting their number, blowing out their number. What are they doing and how do I replicate that? So, you know, enablement is to get you up into that point. And hopefully that enablement is weaving in best practices from top performers as you're iterating. Um, but that coaching, um, you know, is, is more one-to-one -one and it should be doing the, the calibration to help give credibility to the manager. You make a really important point. I have shared this on the show before and I had a professor from Harvard on who talked about this. There's research from Harvard on it specifically, but salespeople, because of the modality of our work style, mm -hmm. and we learn more and glean more from our peers, particularly high performing yeah. tiers, peers, than we do from our managers. Yeah. Right? When you think about coaching and-, and, and aren't on the front line a lot of times. Right. So <laughs> well, to your point of calibrating back to the top performer, yeah. if you can facilitate that, it's like, it, look, it's not just me critiquing you here. I'm critiquing yeah. you in relation to what's working out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the best way to coach is, you know, is to not tell someone, but to show them. Right. And so if you can really, as a manager, go in and say, okay, let's look at what, you know, this person did. How do you see that being different from what you did? Then you can make them have the aha moment that then drives, you know, change that's everlasting and not just them doing what their manager said in a, in a one-off scenario. The didactic approach. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So switching up random here. Okay. Well, fun. So we'll get <laughs> off the topic of sales and marketing for just a quick moment. We'll come back. So for those that are listening, uh, a personal anecdote about Haley is she has a beautiful Aussie doodle. I forget how old Rue is. How, how old did you say? Just turned two in January. <laughs> two in January. So this is your baby, I presume, yeah, right? Is. Right. <laughs> she is. Fun fact, I had never heard of the, the breed Aussie doodle before, which in itself <laughs> is just the coolest name. But a fun fact, I was, I was Googling and they make great therapy dogs. 
<laughs> did you know that? Um, I didn't actually know that, but it totally tracks and, and makes a lot of sense. I'm very um, connected to, to my dog Rue right. as well. <laughs> they say the underlying reason is because they're highly perceptive, highly uh -huh. intelligent breeds. Yeah. And as a dog person myself, I've got a couple of terriers here at home. Uh, we're, we're all about dog life. So uh, she's saw... incredibly, she's incredibly smart and has already taught me um, a lot of lessons, a lot of life lessons just through, you know, being her dog mom. <laughs> yeah. Has she helped you? Has she been your oh, therapy yeah. dog? Yeah. A hundred. I think she's like given me therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're mirrors, right? <laughs> they, they, hey, they're a product of their environment, kind of like salespeople and kids, you know, they, good exactly. parents, yeah, good leaders, all that. Cool. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, um, looking at your track record, you have grown your career quite a bit and have, I think at one point you mentioned how you had something like four layers under you. Uh, from mm -hmm. So from a sales leadership standpoint, you've been promoted on and built multiple teams. I think the SDR team at High Spot was close to 200 people. You built a Rev or a Rev Ops org that was close to 100 people, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of work and dedication and passion, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So, talk to me about you know, moving on and letting go of these teams, these projects. Uh, yeah. Doing it once is one thing, but you've done it multiple times over. So for those that are listening in that are on the precipice of moving on to something else, whether externally or internally, after building something for years, how do you mm. process letting go of the baby you, <laughs> you just had, right? Yeah. I mean, it's tough. Uh, there's no sugarcoating that. I think that when you're passionate about um, people, and developing people within the organization and not just the business side of things, um, it makes it increasingly more difficult. Um, but I also am extremely passionate about learning. And I think that, you know, part of giving things away, um, there, there was a really great article um, about this. Let's see if I can reference it, but it's about giving away your Legos. Um, and in order to grow, you have to give your, give away your Legos, you know, to, to others. And you know, I was, I was told that from, um, very early on, but it, uh, you know, didn't resonate probably until the past. kids don't give away their Legos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I mean, especially when you're earlier in career, it's like, you want to do everything. Right? right. And I think at one point in time I was doing like every role at this company and first and foremost, you'll burn out doing that without a doubt. And second of all, you know, I think that when you're able to delegate, or give away your Legos really effectively, you also open up an opportunity for others to grow within the business. And so I've seen, you know, the SDR team, the leadership that, you know, is, is now leading that team, you know, is just been incredible to see them step up and take on those opportunities. And, you know, for me, I'm still there to, you know, mentor, help, support in any way that I can. Um, but if I look at, you know, the learning opportunity to go and do something different, whether it's building out, you know, operations or enablement or taking on, you know, my current role, um, you know, I think it keeps you really sharp and it allows you to get a lot more breadth to um, breadth of experience um, within the organization. So um, I, I think it's I think it's hard. I mean, at, at high spot, I think of experience from a functional standpoint, but also from like a size of growth standpoint. I mean, I joined the company back when we were, um, you know, 14 employees and, you know, we're now over a thousand. And so even going through the, you know, kind of process of being, you know, a 50 person company, a 200 yeah. person company, yeah. a 500 adolescence, teenager. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of a grieving process. Um, that goes, that <laughs> My goes baby's grown that. up now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so in some ways I was forced <laughs> to do that. Um, it just happened. Um, I think the pandemic and being remote really helped me uh, give away my Legos even more because I couldn't have that face-to-face -face interaction with people. So I had to kind of let go of things a little bit more. Uh, my control freak tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you're passionate about people, you've got to give them that next opportunity to grow. And if you're in their way, you can't do that. And, um, you know, I will get bored if I'm not constantly learning. And so taking on new opportunities, um, whether that, you know, even if that's a lateral move or not, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter because I think at the end of the day, if you're passionate about something, you're learning, you're growing, you'll, you'll be successful at it. 
Well, and I love the skill development piece. Now it's an opportunity for you to learn, you know, go on and learn more. And in the vein of that is also flexing that mentorship model, uh, yeah. muscle, right? Because now yeah. you're mentoring these teams or leaders, I'd imagine. Absolutely. Well, and I think that, you know, the more perspective that you have and that others have, the more you're going to have alignment across your organization and better people connections. I mean, even mm -hmm. if I think about many of the people that started out on Good our point. SDR team, like I said, I mean, I have people that have gone on to be leaders in our services organization and enablement and AEs and AMs, and all of them have this understanding of other functions within the organization. I mean, the SDR team is oftentimes in most organizations, one of the most underappreciated organizations, but now Amen. when you have leaders um, within other functions that came up through that organization, there's an inherent appreciation and sense of gratitude and understanding um, and I think understanding really creates more empathy. And if you have more empathy across the organization, you'll have more alignment and really be able right. to deliver better business outcomes and create a better customer experience. So I think there's business advantages to it uh, as well. Um, and perspective just, I think, is is so important in that. And you can't be static doing the same thing and and still maintain that perspective. Well, a great point. It goes full circle to our earlier point about the talent development, not cutting ourselves off with the profiles that we're looking at. And Absolutely. it goes to the lifetime value of our employees. I don't think enough Absolutely. is, you know, talked about in terms of the investment that we make and the value that they bring, uh, not just no, the lifetime I mean, value of our customers. Especially in tech. I mean, you see people company hopping every, you know, two, three years, which, you know, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, gaining perspective and experience and moving from company to company is also, there's a lot to be said for that. But, you know, having someone that's been at your company for quite some time, I mean, there's so much value that comes um, along with that. And I think respect should be given for it. Absolutely. And thank you. And I agree with you on the point of sales development being undervalued, underappreciated okay. when, yeah, there's so much promise that, that can be. And when you think about the deliverable of pipeline insurance Old you know, effectively, yeah, yeah I mean, you, you think like, you'd want to. <laughs> it's so funny. So many people want to come and inspect what the team's doing. And one of the things that I always said when I was leading the team is I was like, if you go through our discovery call training, then you can sit down and listen to however many calls you want. But until you've like gone and done it yourself, like no, <laughs> because it's very easy to critique without having, again, empathy for what they actually have to do day in and day out. Um, it's one of the hardest jobs. And I think everyone at some point in their career should do it if you're going to be on the go to market team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't want to miss the point about how the alignment becomes even more natural and effective yeah. in the organization because we talk about alignment. I was just prepping with another guest who's a, a RevOps expert, and the, you know, obviously RevOps is at the center of alignment, and we always give lip service to alignment. We, we maybe yeah. we give we we have a CRO, we we label things in the CRM, but are we really? <laughs> driving to your point about enablement or we operationalizing and driving the, that, that change. So yeah. I love that how when you move people in the organization around the organization and move them up and around that yeah. you're creating alignment. Through that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people, process and systems all have to come together to create really great alignment. And I think what we were talking about is the people element. And then you mm -hmm. have to make sure that your systems and process are set up to drive that inherent alignment as well, because the way functions operate, they're inherently almost incentivized to not be aligned. Um, just the way that they work, personalities, those types of things. And so you have to be very intentional about it. But I think the people, process, and systems really have to come together to make that happen. So doubling down on your career, you, as I mentioned, have moved up several times and done a lot of great things. And I want to touch on the issue, if you will, or the debate that top performers who are promoted into management is a, is a bad choice when in fact that worked out really, really well for you. You were a top performing <laughs> account executive. You went into a frontline management role. You went to middle management. You're an executive management now. Yeah. So if, if you can, obviously that does work. There is a model where top performers can be good oh, leaders, sure. yeah, yeah, right? Yep. But two perspectives I want from you is a, that is, is there, is there another way besides promoting top, top performers and B, what, what kind of differences do you see or have you had in managing going from frontline IC to frontline to middle manager to, uh, you know, executive leadership, leadership yeah. focus and skills needed. 
I mean, I think that a lot of times the big mistake that people make that I think you hear a lot about is that just because you're a top performer doesn't mean that you're going to be a great leader. And a lot of times they'll say like, oh, they're a great performer. Like, let's just put them in management and then they can, you know, right. amplify that across eight people, 10 people, you know, how, however many it is. That's not true. <laughs> big assumption. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and if you just look at sports analogies, it's like, you know, in both ways. It's like, just because the person's the number one athlete doesn't mean they're going to be the best coach. And sometimes the best coaches weren't the top performers, but they were still good. Right. And so I think that, you know, I think that there's some like innate qualities about an effective leader that you can identify very, very early on. I mean, when I would interview every single one of our, you know, SDRs that would come onto the team, I could tell you from the interview, if they were going to go the leadership route, or if they were going to go the IC route, sometimes people have a high level of self-awareness around it where they're like, I don't want to be responsible for others. And sometimes people want to be into leadership because they want to be in the room or at the table, not because they're passionate about serving people. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's usually the big piece that I see is people that say, I want to do strategy or I want to be in the room. It's like, that doesn't make you a leader. I mean, and I think it's really- That sounds like an ego play. Yeah. And if sometimes it's, it's, because it's because they want to have a lot of times that signal to me is that they're not being given the broader context to understand what impact they can have on the organization. So they're craving knowledge and information so that they can better ideate on how they can make an impact in the organization. And so just by getting them in the room in some conversations, maybe on a particular project or on an initiative Uh without putting them into a leadership role, you can still get the same outcome. Um, but I think that, you know, really effective leaders are really passionate about, like, I think of servant leadership, like you want to help develop others, help them grow, help them reach their, their full potential. And I think, you know, you can coach that, um, or uncover it or give people experiences that would make them see it. And then, then they could find their passion relative to that, but you can kind of spot it, um, early on. I think what, a lot of organizations don't do a great job of is they don't do a great job of nurturing that leadership because what will happen is they might not be the 10% of performers. They might be the top 30%. And because they're not the 10%, they shouldn't be in a leadership position, even though the skills that they have are you know, phenomenal relative to leadership and their performance is good enough to, to get them there. So I think you really have to have a very intentional program to nurture top performers in an IC role and nurture them from a a people leadership standpoint. Um, And I also think it's worth noting, and I think our CEO has done a great job of, you know, nurturing this within our organization is that you don't have to be a people manager to be a leader within the organization. Sometimes the best leaders are individual contributors within the organization. And by putting them in a people leadership role, you're actually doing them in the business a disservice. So I think there's multiple paths. You can go an IC route and I don't want to be in strategic conversations. I don't want to be in a You can still be a change agent. Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, Or you can go more more of of that leadership route. Um, So I think it's just, and, and then- you know, as part of that, one of the most important things of having someone in leadership is being able to identify talent and help them figure out what their path looks like. You know, I mean, that's, you can have so many missed up. I mean, I would talk to people in an interview in an SDR and I'd be like, you're going to be a sales engineer one day, like instantly, like just know it. And it's not that they have to hop into that role right away, but it's how do you give them the opportunities in the SDR role or even in an AE role that exposes them to the more technical side of the product, gets their hands on it so that then they can, you know, experience that. They stay excited. They develop the skill. Yeah. Yeah. Give them, you know, help them network within the organization to understand what that's like. Um, It's like, you kind of want to have like little mini internships kind of going around um, within the organization because you know, when you can see it click for someone and they've found the area of the business where they're passionate about it. I mean, talk about productivity and capacity and performance. Like that's the best way to get the most out of people is to help them find something that they're passionate about and they'll be successful without anyone helping them. Tap into that intrinsic motivation. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're running low on time, but I wanted to save my favorite topic for last. Okay. <laughs> uh, next month is uh, Women's History Month, yeah. and I don't have enough women guests on my show. I try and I do my best, but I want <laughs> to always have a diverse <laughs> panel uh, of guests. And 
I want to understand from your perspective, it's kind of the, the challenges that a woman faces in navigating a career in sales leadership as a minority myself. Uh, I've had to navigate things differently. Uh, but as, from a woman's perspective, talk to me about what you've had to do differently, you think, from your peers to get where you are. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in my past before even coming to High Spot, um, I was in predominantly, you know, uh, male dominated industries. You know, I was in commercial real estate right, right before um, where I was, you know, I think one of three female brokers in the entire, wow. you know, greater Seattle <laughs> area. So I think from, you know, a very early on time, I had to learn how to navigate kind of a more male dominated um, environment. But I think in sales specifically, I think that, you know, if you look at kind of the broader industry, one of the hardest things is that there's just not as many, you know, women in leadership. And so what that then means is that you kind of have to pave your own path. And like, listen, we've made a lot of progress over, sure. you know, the, the past years. And I think there's a lot of really great um, communities that have been put in place to help, you know, nurture and develop, um, and, you know, create alliances for, for people in the industry. But, um, I think that for me, at least the dynamics really shift when you start to move up within the organization and there's less representation or less people that are similar to you. If you are in more of a, you know, minority type, um, uh, group. Right. And so I think that you really have to learn. I always tell people like you have to learn how to navigate up across and down. And I think that managing up as a woman in sales has always been something that's come a little bit um, easier. I think one of the hardest things to manage is managing across really? um, because you have peers that aren't used to working with someone that's not like them. And so there can be a little bit of a competitive element or, uh -huh you know, a, I don't know how to work with you effectively. And just the unknown can oftentimes be a little bit jarring for people. And so you have to introduce new ways of working. Um, and so I think that dynamic of, you know, working across is, is definitely something that, you know, needs to be talked about a little bit more. Um, and, you know, the more that we talk about it, I think the more it helps the kind of next generation. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's why I wanted to bring it up. Obviously, there's a timing element. We're recording here at the end of February. Next month is March. And, you know, we had the Women's History Month. It's Black History Month, you know, right now. Uh, so I'm, we're celebrating that. But I always wanted to try and bring a, attention to the conversation because yeah. it starts with having it and, and, the, and, and going from there. I think the biggest thing is, like, there are no rules. I mean, for better or worse, I've always not been a rule follower um in my life and career and i think sometimes that's you know created challenges for me but in other times it's helped me break through barriers in a lot of ways right, right. i would just encourage people that like just because something's been done one way before doesn't mean that that's the way that it has to be done in the future and you know i think a big part of um unfortunately the burden that we carry is that we have to educate and help others see a different way of doing things but you know, I see that as not a burden because it's helping others that are going to come after me. If you could have lunch with any of your woman heroes, female heroes, who would it be dead or alive? Oh, that's so hard. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. So one that I think that I would, okay. One that I think that I would have a lot of fun with. <laughs> Um, and I think I could learn some from her. Um, I've been watching a lot of Top Chef recently and I love Padma Lakshmi. <laughs> um, she's there you one. Go. I would probably want to go have like drinks and a late night of food out with her. Um, I also, I love um, women who have just kind of broke through barriers and been kind of controversial in their space. So even like an Amal Clooney would be really interesting to meet. I think she's um, uh, created a lot of stir in a space that again is uh, heavily male dominated. Who is that? Amal Clooney is it? Mm -hmm. and done it with a lot of she's really leaned on her intelligence and skill set to create space for herself mm -hmm. um and I think that being an ex th there's no better way than being an expert to have that credibility to say I deserve to be here um and I think Padma is like the opposite where she I mean not the opposite but um she approaches she has a lot of 
you know, sass and humor um, and really approaches it kind of from a people standpoint and doesn't really, you know, take any shit from anyone, which, which authentic. I yeah, that. it keeps yeah. it real. The <laughs> so, combo of those two, I'd love to sit in between both of them. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of the Sales Consultant Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, it would go a long way if you were to write a short review on the listening app of your choice.